honored to attend this afternoon's session. And so I am really uh, anxious to get this conversation on the way so that we stay true to our times. I also want to acknowledge that we are live feeding on YouTube and that this will be made available uh, for persons who may want to share or interact with us a little later uh, as we progress, okay? So again, welcome to everyone. Thank you so much for making the time to work alongside the CAB in addressing what is becoming or what has become and remains a very consistent challenge for members throughout the region. Um, I want to start by saying the turnout today is really very encouraging. We are at 501 and we are seeing 48 persons already on. So that basically speaks to the fact that uh, we are keenly aware of the impact and the gravity of the topic that we will be addressing today, but more so that we are all very aware of the impact on our economies and of course on our livelihoods and therefore underpinning a deep desire to do more than just identify the challenge, but more critically to find mutually beneficial solutions. In this, this is an area in which the CAB has been heavily engaged over the past few years and one that we recognize to be of great concern to the region and the financial services sector, and of course, specifically our own members. We are at a stage where we need to find ways and means of turning back the clock on de risking. So it is indeed timely that we are able to hear today from some of our friends and partners at Digital Finance and the Atlantic Council, who make up our esteemed panel of, of experts today. This evening, I am delighted to be joined by Gavin Coles, an internationally experienced risk and compliance professional with deep knowledge of global and national EML legislation, sanction regimes and frameworks for combating bribery and corruption. Gavin provides advice and guidance to both regulators and financial institutions on regulatory and event related issues around anti-money laundering, sanctions, financial crime risk and corruption. Uh, Gavin, maybe a, a hand up so that everyone knows exactly who you are. Thank you so much. And Louis Foucault holds a chair in law at the La Trobe Law School in Australia, where he is the coordinator and reg tech program lead of the La Trobe Law Tech team. Louis has continuously worked with the World Bank, the Alias for Financial Inclusion, the Financial Action Task Force, FATF, and regional and national regulators on integrity and inclusion over the past decade. Louis has had a direct impact on international regulations, including the 2009 policy decision of the FATF that financial integrity and financial inclusion mm -hmm. objectives be aligned as well as, is, as its recognition of a low risk exemption to its 2020 proliferation financing standards. He was a lead creator of the World Bank Vulnerability Assessment Tool for Money Laundering and Terrorist Financing Risk, which is used by 150 countries to perform national risk assessments. Both join us from Digital Financial. And Vicky Ann Acevero, Vicky, is currently a senior fellow at the Atlantic Council's Adrian Ashton Latin America Center, where she is leading the newly formed Caribbean Initiative. Vicky is also an international lawyer and was a partner at Holland and Knight, where she specialized in the representation of developing countries in Africa and the Caribbean, specifically in their relations with foreign and institutional investors. Today, Vicky will provide a broad overview of the role of the Atlantic Council so that we can have an understanding of some of the work being undertaken to address the vexing issues of correspondent banking. Today, we look forward to a very lively, engaging and educational conversation. And we encourage you to use the Q&A function to share your queries, any queries that you may have. We will try to allow for some one-on-one -on -one, uh, live questions from the audience, time permitting. And so without further ado, please allow me to hand you over to Louis and, and Gavin. Gentlemen, welcome. And thank you again for joining us today. Thank you very much indeed, Wendy. Um, I'm going to share my screen now for those of you um, online, um, and that should mean that we have a full view. So if I can have just confirmation from the chair that that is appearing on your screens. Wonderful. Yes. Okay, very good. 
Um, so to all of those in the audience uh, around the world, wherever you may be, uh, very good to be here this morning. Um, Louis and I are sitting in Australia. Um, it would normally have sun streaming, streaming in the window here to my, to my right, uh, but unfortunately we had some rather big storms, so I do look a bit dark compared to some of the, uh, some of the rooms that you're in, which look much more welcome. Um, so we don't have much time, so I will move on to talk about um, the real issues today, which are around correspondent banking and the challenge that we see both in your region and other regions around the world as well. Um, you've heard mention of digital financial uh, already a few times, just very quickly. This is a, a collection of experts that we've come together um, to form a real, a real brains trust to help organizations, to help governments, to help private, um, private industry, uh, to help any organizations that have a particular need to understand finance and digital transformation, digital solutions. Uh, and we're very lucky to have so many people with so much experience around the world. Um, and on this particular issue, we, we've combined my experience of the, the, the coal faces as it were, working within the banking system and working within intelligence and law enforcement, uh, and Louis' great knowledge um, from the government, uh, NGO and academic side. So we're going to run through the current situation, both in your region and elsewhere. Uh, we're going to talk about some, some opportunities that are coming up from the global uh, NGO uh, perspective. We think are, are very relevant to the discussion. I'm then going to talk to you about how banks decide to de-risk, because that's a real issue here. We talk about correspondent banking, that's not the problem. The problem we have is the de-risking that's been going on and that the barriers put in, in, in the way of the normal way of doing things, how things have been done um, historically. And we'll talk about how there is a real information gap in some banks um, between the reality on the ground of the great work that's been happening in your region uh, and actually what they think is happening and why that's driving some of their decisions. And then we'll, we'll wrap up by talking about some of the ways in which we think there are options for change, how you can actually end up with a better result um, in, in this difficult area of correspondent banking relationships. So the current situation, many of you will be aware of this um, already. We've seen for many years uh, a reduction in services to certain parts of the world, to certain uh, financial institutions, the larger correspondent banks out of the US and out of Europe and out of Australasia uh, have often uh, reduced year on year the services provided. There's been a cutback uh, both on the individual and the regional level. Some correspondent banks have in fact decided to withdraw from entire regions. They have pulled out of entire areas because they think the risk is, is too high or the costs, implied costs are too high. And what that has meant, and you've seen this and we've seen this, it's really increased costs for the legitimate users. It's made it more difficult for small financial organizations um, to, to use and provide services to their customers uh, and businesses and what I call organic payments have suffered. And organic payments are those payments from families, from parents to children, children to parents, uh, money for operations, money for education, money for study. The, the rapid and easy flow of that is becoming more difficult because this de-risking issue that we've seen, um, and that is not good for anybody. It's not good for business, but more importantly, not good for your, your citizens uh, and your fellow, uh, your fellow members in your, in your countries. We've also seen with the pandemic, with international travel more difficult, it has been um, less easy to get direct meetings with correspondent bank relationships, either to establish new relationships or to meet uh, with existing representatives, and also there's been more need for fund movement. Uh, certainly in my extended network, I've known people that need to move money uh, rapidly between jurisdictions where they haven't had to do that for a long time. The pandemic has heightened the need to move money between individuals and businesses at the very time where we see further de-risking and further um, challenges. And what that means is that we're seeing, just as when there is uh, water trying to escape the dam, water will always find a path of least resistance. We're also seeing with money flows, we're seeing that people with legitimate need to move money between jurisdictions, between countries, are looking for any way to do this now as the mainstream banking relationships and correspondent banking become more difficult. And so what do people do? Well, they turn to other methods, Hawaladar, so underground banking services, specialist transfer firms for currency movements, which can be very good, but may create issues in terms of transparency for regulators. Um, and we also see criminal organizations stepping into the gap. We've seen this certainly in, in, in Australia. Uh, we've seen criminal organizations uh, who have assets or, or debts across jurisdictional uh, relationships. They're very willing to move money, move money, no money actually moves across the border, to move money for legitimate individuals. Um, parents want money for their, their children in Australia. 
very, very nice if organized crime groups can step into the gap from their perspective. It means they can lord the money and have cross-border transfer of value without having to use the mainstream correspondent banking network. That actually strips out information for governments and law enforcement and makes it easier to launder and harder uh, to investigate. So there are a number of knock-on negatives um, to the current situation that we see. Uh, I think this has jumped forward. Here, Gavin. To... Right. Um, that, that, that sets the scene, um, I think, in a very, very, very solid way. Um, we've been looking at risk-related debanking for about 16 years now with uh, a very important way from 2013. We've seen a lot of action and a lot of discussion. What we haven't seen is improvement. We have seen a bit of stabilization, but that could be because everything that could be lost was lost and uh, there was nothing further left to cut deeper. Um, but we've arrived at a very important uh, uh, point uh, in this first part of 2021. And I really want to commend the association for having this discussion now. Now, I'm very conscious of the limited time that we have to set the table. Now, I'm going to be brief. I could have started with the innovative uh, program of international financial standard setters involving uh, also uh, the Financial Action Task Force but uh, led by the FSB and the CPMI to look at uh, an innovative new uh, cross-border payment system. Um, very interesting work currently being done around that that may set new patterns for the future. But in relation to immediate opportunities, um, I think it's important to note at, uh, to, to look at what's been happening at FATF in the past couple of weeks. They have just launched a new unintended consequences review, a project focused on mitigating the unintended consequences of the FATF standards. And not only that, de-risking is one of the four key topics. Uh, the other is financial inclusion. It also touches on impact on human rights and then impact on uh, not-for-profits. So at the heart of that, are the things that we're discussing today. This is an important opportunity for comment. They've opened it up for public comment. Unfortunately, the deadline is literally within a couple of weeks, 20th of April. So that's an important opportunity that, that, that I, I think should enjoy attention literally in, if it hasn't done already in the next few days. But in conjunction with that, there are a couple of other things happening at FATF too. They've also published for comment uh, new guidance or revised guidance on virtual asset service providers that may not look at face value immediately relevant, but some of those concepts start touching on the subject matter of de-risking. And they're also working on the new proliferation financing standards that they adopted in 2019 which is going to require a new uh, wave of risk assessments specifically focused on uh, breaches of targeted financial sanctions. This is important because we fear that if that is not handled well at a country and regional level and globally, that it may start a further wave of de-risking. So we've got great opportunities to contribute from a FATF perspective, but we've also got some risks coming from the FATF process, and all of that are going to play themselves out in, uh, in, in the next couple of weeks, leading up to the June plenary. Uh, next slide, please, Gavin. But it's not only the international opportunities that we should look at. Uh, I think you are probably very aware of the very interesting developments in the past couple of months in the United States. Um, the uh, Office of uh, the US Comptroller of the Currency introduced new rules called Fair Access to Financial Services uh, rules in January 2021. They've then been put on hold. They would have entered into effect uh, in April. Um, but this kind of indicates a new way of thinking about de-risking because this set of rules would have required the large banks not to deny any person a financial service on offer 
unless justified by quantified, quantified and documented failures to meet quantified impartial risk-based standards of the bank set in advance. Mm. Um, now, the implementation of this was paused, but I think the message coming from this idea is clear. We don't want any longer just a refusal of services. We want the refusal of services to be based on solid risk grounds that can be proven. This links beautifully with what Europe has recognized for many years as the so-called right to a basic bank account, and that they broadened under uh, the Payment Services Directive 2 to right to the payment access for, uh, for, for, for money service businesses. Um, it's been put on hold, but there's, in a sense, been a bigger development, and that's the Anti-Money Laundering Act of 2020 that was also adopted earlier this year, because that requires uh, the GAO to prepare a report on options for financial institutions to handle high-risk transactions and accounts without compromising AML CFT, and basically read in there without de-risking unnecessarily. Um, They've already been doing good work in this space. They need to produce a report and then the act charges the Secretary of Treasury to within a year of receiving that report, review, review the current regulations and guidance and have a de-risking strategy. So there's an international discussion happening, but there's a very important discussion happening right next to you. And while the international one is open and has invited comment, um, it's important to figure out how best to input into the US process. Next slide, Gavin. So while these opportunities are open, what can banks do? What can the members of the associations do? Over to you, Gavin. Thank you very much. Um, and you've heard there from Louis that, that there's a real debate going on now, and especially in the US where they're a little bit further down the road in terms of recognizing that de-risking historically has been um, used sometimes to deny services or, or not provide services or withdraw services um, to customers, both individual and, and otherwise, that actually should have that service uh, for, for a range of reasons. And I'm talking here historically about some of the risk drivers and decision processes that, that, that I've certainly seen and friends of mine have seen uh, across some of the, 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 the large international banks. So and this is historical. I think there is a change coming, as Louis said, which is, which is why it's a very good time to talk about this. So most international banks will have country risk, country risk models and regional risk models within their AML programs. And what that means is that they will assess on an annual basis or a more frequent basis, the individual risk that they place on a country or a jurisdiction or a region. And that will drive how they behave towards customers, both new and existing in that region. It will drive the um, the KYC collected, it will drive the ongoing due diligence, it will drive the enhanced due diligence, it may drive the products that can be offered in that country, in that region. It may drive the profitability that's needed per customer in that country. And that country risk model is absolutely critical in terms of this issue of de-risking and withdrawal of, of correspondent banking services. Now, the, the, you know, the bad news is that historically some of those models were, were very simple in nature. There wasn't a lot of guidance from the regulator on how the model should be built. And so a lot of organizations built their own models. They um, sometimes had assistance from external bodies, external consultants to build the models. Um, they were somewhat simple in nature. Uh, they would look at a, a small number of factors feeding into the risk models. They would take um, headlines, um, sometimes from, from the media. And very importantly for this issue of correspondent banking, often where a bank had been stung before because they'd had a regulatory failure or a money laundering failure or a sanctions failure linked to a certain jurisdiction or, or, or market area, that weighting would feed into the risk model to say, we've, we've failed once here, we, or some another bank has failed once here, we don't want to fail again, therefore we're going to treat that as higher risk. <clears throat> so it's tying into the regulatory risk, tying into the, into the, the perceived compliance risk and tying into the real money laundering risk to create this, this, this risk model. Sometimes um, you would see entire regions, such as your region, uh, given a risk assessment. And that may be because of the perception of the individuals working within that bank, either in the business or the compliance department. 
And we all know how the media and the entertainment industry loves to paint with a very, very wide brush certain parts of the world. You know, if you if you believe everything you saw in, in the media about Australia, we're about kangaroos and fire. That's all we have. That's not true at all. We're much, 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 much more complex than that. Um, so this is the challenge that you've had to face because some of those risk models were fairly simple in nature and based upon data, which, yes, you could say it was based on real data that really existed, but only a very small part of the complex picture that is the truth for every organization seeking one of these uh, relationships. Um, I mentioned profitability, absolutely key. You know, banking is business. It's about the profitability you can make from the relationship. If the risk is high and you're not making enough profitability, either per transaction or overall, that's a heavy weight against actually continuing that, with that relationship. Um, we have seen examples where banks have um, withdrawn services from certain um, sectors or markets and then re-entered or offered their own product that they can control the profitability to make money on, gone back into the same risk area to provide that service. So cutting out um, other providers, despite the fact the underlying, underlying laundering risk may not have changed, but it becomes more profitable, therefore it, it, can, it can fit in the model, it can cover the compliance costs. Um, you should be familiar with the questionnaires you would have received in respect to correspondent banking services. Normally, um, fairly standardized, the Wolfberg questionnaire, very good. Uh, used by many banks, but some banks also use their own questionnaires or, or additional questions. We'll come back to why that's so important to get right uh, in, in a few moments. And the way this works in the large banks is that there'll be a risk threshold at which a correspondent banking relationship um, you know, has, uh, is unacceptable if it falls below the threshold. And that combines all of these issues of country risk, um, of profitability, other risk uh, matters involved, um, lots of drivers of the risk and profitability. If it falls below the threshold, then it's up for deletion um, or non-offering in the first place. Now, where the flexibility comes in is that often the business manager may have a direct conversation with the compliance area or the control area to explain why this particular correspondent banking relationship is critical to the business as a whole, or there's a strategic value for the country Maybe a US bank has, a, has an understanding with the government that there is a strategic value in keeping a cross banking relationship in a certain jurisdiction or a certain area. Um, it might be the bank has other customers that have to run money in and out of the, the country um, legitimately, um, and therefore they need to keep the cross banking relationship even though the risk is high. Lots of debate can happen, but I've seen personally the frontline business fail to understand how to present the factual information from their correspondent banking clients to the compliance function and therefore have to get rid of good relationships because the compliance function hasn't been given a fair picture of the correspondent banking risk. And I suspect that's a real danger for your region. It's a real danger for, for your, you and your organizations because if you're relying upon someone that doesn't really understand your business to make your case without you being part of the conversation, you're starting at a minus five, um, really. And I've put a point there, which is it's no different than a mortgage or a credit card application. If bad data is going in, you're going to get bad data coming out, and that will play against you when it comes to these, these decisions of de-risking. Um, here's an example in terms of how the world is unfair in terms of, I think unfair in terms of this, 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 this risk assessment and the de-risking in correspondent relationships. So if we look at the EU country back blacklist, um, been around for many years, many of you may be very familiar with it. Um, there's been movements in, in 2020 and 21. We see some of your uh, jurisdictions have been added, uh, some moved to the grey list um, early in 2021. Um, if you spoke to many compliance officers or bank officers around correspondent relationships and you said to them, well, if someone's on the EU country blacklist, does that mean that they are higher risk and probably not, you know, not acceptable for a correspondent bank relationship or a new correspondent relationship? Many compliance officers, I think, would be tempted to say, yes, well, that, that's obviously an indicator. An international body has researched and said there's a particular risk, high risk with these regions. Uh, well, yes, but Australia has been on the grey list since 2019. And I don't see Australian banks having a huge difficulty in getting, getting correspondent relationships uh, because that conversation, that perception is reality uh, when it comes down to, 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 to often these decisions. And in terms of using specific information um, from official bodies. So I quoted the, um, the US uh, INCR report here from 2019 about uh, Dominica. So there's, there's 
negative news there around the citizen, citizen process in, in uh, Dominica. That could be picked up as part of the risk assessment, the evaluate the country risk assessment. But there's always positive news in there as well, either from the same source or other sources. And what you don't know is in your, in your larger correspondent bank, how are they treating, how are they weighting these commentaries? It's very easy when you have a very large amount of information for your inbuilt biases to push certain regions one way and certain regions the other way. So that's why it's so important. We'll come on to um, some of your solutions shortly. Okay, so what can you do? Well, the first thing is making sure that you understand your business in a way that you can present to your correspondent banks uh, to really make them confident that you understand your risk and they understand your risk as well. So that's understanding your product sets, your volumes. In your business, you will know there will be some product sets and some customer sets that are higher risk than others. You may find that 80, 90% of your product set is actually very low risk, it's ag business in your country, it's individuals trying to send money back and forth to America. Understanding that, having that ready to present as part of the conversation can be very, very useful because that often isn't given by smaller correspondent bank, uh, smaller correspondent um, banking relationships um, to the larger players. Um, giving the information helps the business um, dialogue um, with compliance. Many of you I know have uplifted your AML and section controls in recent years. Great work done there, not just training of staff, but recruitment, expansion, system uplifts, auditing, all of that documented so that when you're having the conversation about why you are not a risk, it's very, very clear. If I'm sitting on a committee within a large bank and I'm debating which organizations to keep for correspondent relationships, and one of them has an A4 document that says, Here all, here's all the AML and section controls that, that we've improved year on year, that is a massive boost, massive boost to the perception, which is what a lot of this is about. Um, ensure your training and other compliance commitments are up to date. Uh, very simple, but it's a great conversation to say, all our staff have been trained again, you know, as is required, et cetera, et cetera. Um, something to make it real, and this ties back to what Lou was saying about the humanitarian angle, making um, individuals outside, your, outside of your region understand how important it is for money to move freely and in a cost-effective manner through these services. So real examples where you have customers who want to send money to Miami, want to send money um, to, 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 to Orlando. So understanding those needs and, and examples of legitimate business. Um, in terms of the questionnaires, whether it's a Wolfsburg questionnaire or other questionnaires, um, having a really clean and standardized response. And I think the CAB uh, could do some work there to standardize responses in terms of making sure that it's clear and there's, there's some easy mistakes you can make in those questionnaires. Very important to, 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 to avoid those pitfalls. And if there's any indication an existing relationship is under threat, maybe a business manager says to you, oh, I've got a compliance review coming up in, in three months' time, that's the time to get on the front foot. Get on the front foot. Um, face the bowler, as it were, um, and really get in there and start liaising with the CAB to make sure that, that that assistance can be given in terms of the presentation, again, the best case possible across. Um, <clears throat> so there are some things that, that, that can be thought about as well in terms of, of pre preparation. So preparing materials and templates so that everyone's using the same language, that can really help as well, because then the region gets an uplift as a whole. When there are direct engagements and discussions with, with the international correspondent banks, whether it's the uh, business managers or even better, the compliance departments, the, the decision makers, having somebody there with you to make that discussion flow uh, is very good. Um, as I said earlier, examples of the humanitarian need for these payments. This is, you know, I've seen correspondent banking running into sanctioned countries legitimately with significant risk, significant risk of terrorism financing or other issues. Why? Because the humanitarian need was clear, documented and supported by the bank senior management. So very important to, 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 to think about, especially if there's disaster recovery work, et cetera, et cetera. Um, risk slicing. So understanding that some of your book may not be in the right risk bucket for, the, for your cross on a bank to accept. And being willing to say, we understand that for this segment, you would not like to take the risk. We are not going to send any payments from this segment through your correspondent relationship. So de-risking yourself within a very small part of your book means that the majority of your book can continue to use that correspondent uh, relationship. Uh, and lastly, uh, Louis mentioned how important the US is in terms of some of the really good work they're doing there uh, around uh, inclusion. 
making sure that that direct contact with Washington uh, continues. Okay, so some takeaways to think about before we move on. Um, firstly, I, I would recommend all of you start building cases and examples where you've had customers that want to move money and, and it's difficult, or where you're worried that if the correspondent bank relationships are with, with, withdrawn, there's real harm and real challenge that will come to your communities. Very important uh, to do that. Second is start risk slicing your business. So start thinking about parts of your business that are very low risk from a laundering and sanctions point of view and how you can present that information in a way that means your correspondent banking, uh, correspondent bank relationship holder understands that you understand your business. That's really important. Thirdly, at the local level within your countries, um, in conversations with your, your, your local political players, make them understand this is a real issue. This is a real threat to your local communities in terms of money movements back and forwards and getting that general groundswell of support uh, very important indeed. Okay, that was quite a quick run through, but I hope it was interesting. I think questions. Absolutely, thank you so much, Gavin and Louis. I really appreciate the, the input. It certainly has been very thought provoking and coming out of it, we actually have uh, two questions and one comment. Uh, Vicky, if you would hold on with us for a few more minutes, let's take the first few questions for the gentleman and then we will make the introduction to you. Uh, recognizing that Louis does have to drop off in about 15 minutes thereabouts, um, I want to make sure that he has an opportunity as well. So what we will do is we will actually open the line for the persons who have identified themselves for questions. And so we will start with Earl Gill, and then we will speak to Joel. And finally, uh, I believe it's Prabhkaha uh, Kaza. Uh, we will come to you in that particular order. And then we will hold questions, speak with, with the Vicky, and open again. Um, so Earl, oh. can you raise your hand so that we can it's open? Okay, go ahead, Earl. Yes, um, I guess my question that I had was around uh, the developments that had taken place in FinTech and how that might impact the need in a positive or negative way for correspondent banking in these various uh, countries in the Caribbean and I guess probably across the world. Is that something that Will it help to solve the problem or will it create more problems? Good question. Uh, Louis? If, if, if I may jump in, uh, Earl, uh, I think yes to both. Uh, is it, is it, it's, it's, it's a Chinese saying or a rumored Chinese saying that every, every good solution opens the door to a new set of problems. Um, and the same with technology. I do think that uh, we certainly have the means available now to revolutionize cross-border payments. And that is precisely why the international standard setters are currently combined and, and working on a plan. And it's a very innovative plan, uh, kind of putting together the, the building blocks of uh, an innovative cross-border payment system. How that will pan out we'll have to see, but it, it will indeed give rise just to other problems that we will need to consider. Part of the mix could be central bank digital currencies. So it's the hot topics of today. Um, it's, it's a great debate. Unfortunately, it's focused on the future. So in 10 years time, I think many of the issues that we're dealing with on uh, anti-money laundering will not be as problematic um, for instance, for the past 30 years, we've been grappling with identity challenges. Technology is changing that, uh, especially with what happened during the pandemic. Um, so in the future is going to look different. I don't think we will see a reset on correspondent banking relationships and the way in which trade functions in the 1990s. It's going to be different. But it's important that every bank gets to that point where the future is going to be different. And for that, you need correspondent banking relationships now. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Louis, that, that's exactly what I was gonna say is that yes, things are gonna change, gonna change radically, but you need to be part of the conversation now and have your relationships with the larger, larger international banks. Because uh, my suspicion is that the governments will pull them in the front line 
and you want to be in their correspondent banking relationship list so that you get pulled along and can benefit from those changes. Um, that I think that's the way it's going to go. Great, thank you for that question. Ul. We hope that the answer meets your expectations. Um, in the interest of time, we will move directly on to Joel. Yeah, hi. Thanks for uh, taking my my uh, my question. I just had a quick question. It had to do with a paper that was produced uh, a few in 2016 uh, by the uh, Caribbean uh, uh, Central Bank, looking at the at de-risking and the decline of the correspondent uh, banking relationships. And one of their proposals, one of the thoughts that they threw out was uh, the idea of establishing a, uh, a bank in the United States, a Caribbean presence that would be some sort of a bank or a clearing institution that would uh, be able to uh, to hold these uh, correspondence banking relationships. And I just wanted to, and, but never, nothing ever seemed to come of that uh, proposal. It just seemed to make a lot of sense to me. Um, I just want to throw that out and get your reaction. Thank you. Sure. Um, I, look, I, I always think it's good to think about different options, uh, uh, you know, uh, along the scale. I, I would say that the political and logistical challenges of having one bank in the U.S. that was regulated in the U.S. that had to satisfy all of the players from another region, thinking about how banks work from the inside, I think would be a very interesting place to work, uh, and I'll, I'll put it that way. Um, I, I do think that um, there is absolute room for building strong correspondent relationships with existing US banks if the conversation is done correctly. And that I think will be a more rapid solution um, than building an organization, having all of the cost and difficulty and regulatory issues as well. So I'm not saying it's, it, it's a bad idea, I think it, it, it's a less easy to make succeed quickly idea. Thank you for that, uh, Joel. I hope that answers your question. We will move quickly on to Prabhaka. I hope that I'm pronouncing your name correctly. Uh, please feel free to, to speak. Unmuted myself. Yes, Hello, we can, can hear me. We can, yes. Yeah, right. The main uh, problem uh, seems to be for uh, banks like us, which are practically new in this uh, country, Caribbeans. When we approached about 30-odd uh, banks, myself, main uh, problem happened to be that, uh, look, uh, your location is new for us. Have you got your SWIFT number? We don't have any exposure for the, we have an exposure for Africa, we have an exposure for America, but we don't have an exposure for the Caribbeans at all. You run your bank for about six months and then come to us. And, uh, you know, we had a whole range of uh, excuses like this until we got at least one bank and then we could run, start running the bank. And including Crown Bank uh, in UK, where I am right now, when we approached them, they told them that, look, you have been formed only for the purpose of providing correspondent banking to Caribbean banks. They would say, oh, that was their history. Lloyd's Bank provides for one or two in uh, Caribbeans. But when we approach them, they said we apply, we are planning to withdraw. Mm -hmm. So I really don't know what can be the solution for improving the correspondent banking relationship for Caribbean banks. Um, thank I you, Dr. Yeah, yeah, and I think that 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 echoes back exactly what we've been saying. That often this this risk view and the risk models that are used don't reflect the reality and the complexity of your organisations and the fact you have legitimate business legitimate customers, very important need for legitimate money movement back and forward using these services. And I think that the wording that you use there um, indicates that broad brush approach I mentioned in terms of risk buckets that they're putting certain regions in um, doesn't reflect the, the reality. And that's why I think having a, 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 a path forward that focuses on not just saying we want a relationship, but demonstrating the risk slicing and the risk understanding you have yourselves, looking at the political angle, because you are in a, in a hugely important region from a geopolitical point of view, hugely important. And the United States recognizes, or I'm sure they recognize the importance of your region and the need for these relationships. And one, if, you can, if we can meld the political, 
and the commercial conversation and demonstrate to these banks that, that you know, you do know what you're doing. You have uplifted hugely your controls. You have risk sliced your population. So this is why you want these services. That's very different than I think what may have happened historically. And I've seen in other regions where you will go to a bank and say, we would like a consequent relationship. And they say, um, a policy says no. And that's the first you get because that, that, that's it. It's much more about <clears throat> going to them with the evidence and the political angle as well to try and make them understand there's a benefit for them in terms of income. And there's a real benefit for your region and the United States as well. That's my view. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, one question. I know Ross has been waiting for a little while. So Ross, let's go to you. Uh, and uh, we will move on to the key from this question. I'll ask everyone else to hold. Thank you so much. Ross, you can go ahead. Okay, perhaps Ross, what I will ask you to do then is to type in your question and we will come back to that. Vicky, let me take a minute again to welcome you. Thank you for being so patient and waiting as we move through uh, the presentation previously. Um, Vicky, why don't I ask you to go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about the Atlantic Council. Well, thank you, Wendy, and thank you, Gavin and Louis, um, for really a wonderful presentation. Um, the Atlantic Council is a Washington DC based think tank. It was founded in 1961 and basically it promotes constructive leadership and engagement in international affairs based on the transatlantic relationships. But most importantly, the council works to promote public understanding and support policies and institutions that build collective security and peace. So I think this public understanding is what we're doing here today. And it is a very important activity, public education about complex issues of which correspondent banking relations are one. Um, last year, um, the Atlantic Council created a Caribbean initiative specifically to deal with um, the neglect uh, by the US Washington policy community about the region and in order to highlight the challenges that the region has been facing, especially in light of the pandemic. Um, in our soundings um, and listening that we did at the end of last year, correspondent banking relations surprisingly rose to almost the top of the priority list among experts and diplomats. Um, this was couched in um, terms of the vulnerability index, Mr. Coker, which was more for the outsized impacts of both climate change and the extra jurisdictional reach of many EU or United States laws and regulations. So as this correspondent banking was a very important issue for the region, we decided that we were going to create a task force and um, we're almost ready to have our first meeting of that task force, probably the second week of April. And we have brought together, we've had conversations with the US Treasury, with the Canadian banks, with the US banks, and obviously with our hosts today, the Caribbean Association of Banks, as well as specific bankers um, in the region. We also are fortunate to have the Inter-American Development Bank, which I am the Caribbean Development Bank um, sitting on that task force. It will be a private task force so that the deliberations can be very candid. And um, we're just looking forward. I myself am not a banker as Wendy introduced me, I'm a lawyer and um, interested in sustainable development. Um, let me just explain to you a little bit about how we thought about um, correspondent banking relations. Um, the, we decided to um, talk about financial inclusion. And so the task force is a financial inclusion task force because we really wanted to 
perhaps turn the problem a little bit around and reframe it. Um, this is a linguistic problem, and I really want us to think very hard about the very word de-risking. It's very problematic. Um, it, it assumes a perspective and a position, uh, which is that somebody needs to take steps to make something less risky. But what is that something that we're really trying to make less risky? And I would say, at least I would posit, that the real goal here is to make illicit capitalism extremely risky. Instead, it seems that we have compelled financial institutions and regulators to become police. And this policing as it's perceived uh, has created anti-bank sentiments. And then this is um, compounded by some of the inefficiencies that are caused by the withdrawal of correspondent banking relations. So when you could make an overnight transfer in the United States, why is it that it could take from three weeks to three months to get the same money into the hands of somebody who is making remittances, trying to run a small business. And so our hope is that by reframing this issue as one of financial inclusion and focusing in on how to simplify and know the customers that are your small, vulnerable, informal customers, if we can take steps to help them then we can, in a more holistic way, start to address the operational, regulatory, and cybersecurity issues, which are clearly very important and which um, Gavin and Louis uh, very, very eloquently expressed. So our intention is to work with the Caribbean countries really to develop the transformational capacity that they need. They don't always have the internal partners that are really necessary for this institutional capacity building, and that is because of their small size. And therefore, I would agree with Gavin about the need for uh, thinking about what kind of collective arrangements we can make on both sides, both the respondent banking side and the correspondent banking side, so that in the end, the financial services sector is profitable for those who are using it. And I will stop there. Vicky, thank you so much for that uh, overview of the Atlantic Council. And certainly I think the opportunity to collaborate with you in identifying opportunities and correcting some of the experiences that we have had and continue to have from a correspondent banking uh, de-risking perspective is, is at least we are starting to find a foundation. In your assessment, can you tell me whether or not you believe that there is an empirical understanding of the impact of de-risking on the industry to date? And can you perhaps elaborate on what steps need to be undertaken to address some of these deficiencies? Well, when you, um, thank you for that question. I, I've thought about it a little bit and empirical evidence, yes, I think that there is certainly empirical evidence of what happens when you are unable to get Forex and when you are unable to do trans transactions. And those are the cross-border flows that we're really talking about in the Caribbean. So there is certainly evidence of that, um, but, that's the impact. The real question is what is driving? And I think maybe Gavin is still here. I mean, it's the anti-money laundering and these perceptions about the risk. And that's why I say that de-risking is something that comes from the perspective of the, the Western or Northern banks, the ones in North America, the ones in Europe, because they are the ones who have decided that it is easier to avoid risk than to manage the risk. And that's understandable in a cost benefit, a pure cost benefit um, analysis, but uh, one really does have to rethink. The risk is not the Caribbean and the Caribbean institutions, although there is some risk there, the risk is getting a fine, a fine that outweighs by such a large amount 
the amount of money that we're talking about. And, you know, if you look at the statistics, the IADB did some work um, with uh, the Central Bank of the Bahamas. And I mean, in the whole region, it's 471 banks or financial institutions, half of which are credit unions. So I think that if we become very granular about what is happening on the ground, and this is again, the bottom up approach that we, when you start to look at the institutions that most people are using, maybe there are ways to strengthen those institutions and help them to get to provide some of the services that are required using some of the new technology that was talked about. I hope that answers. Somewhat. Absolutely, absolutely. I do think that there will be other questions from the audience as we move through. I am very mindful that we have actually come down to the last 10 minutes. Uh, there is another question that I want to pose to you, Vicky, before I open up to the audience again. What is your outlook for the region's industry? And do you have any timelines in mind for a possible resolution? You smile because I'm sure you expected this question to come at you, <laughs> either from me or from the, the participants. Um, as we begin to, to look, or do we need to see this as what will become the new normal in, in this de-risking drive? Well, when you ask what is the outlook for the region's industry, um, I know that you're not really just talking about the banking industry, but the banking industry does underlie the rest of the industries. Correct. Mm -hmm. And the prospects, quite frankly, are grim. We, this whole Latin America, Caribbean region is very low in productivity. COVID continues to take a huge hit and therefore public expenditure, which may have gone for infrastructure, even infrastructure you know, in the banking system is gonna go for health and uh, understandably so. So I, I, I would like for people to remember 2008 and after 9-11 and the high liquidity and the low interest rates and the fact that the banks stopped making money because the investments in tourism uh, did not pan out. So you have a history of the, the cost benefit analysis, which is a very real one and which should be revisited. Um, in the timeline for our task force, however, let me talk about that. We're gonna start in the, the 8th of April and we hope to run the task force through September and come out with a report at the end of September. And you know, we invite all of you to, um, to uh, participate with us through uh, the Caribbean Association of Banks. We do have our experts that we have pulled together that we think are inclusive and representative. So that's our timeline for getting some further recommendations. Okay, excellent. Uh, thank you so much for that overview, Vicky. I would like to open up to our audience. I don't want to hog all of the time. Uh, so if there are any pressing questions, please just raise your hand and we will acknowledge you immediately. Ross, I want to acknowledge as well that you posed your question. Uh, I believe Lisa Skinner may have provided you a response. So uh, let me take a minute to introduce Lisa, who is one of the managing partners with Digital Financial. Um, Lisa, thank you so much for joining us and also for responding to that question. Uh, Ross, if there are any other questions, don't hesitate. Okay. I think we have, do we have any questions here? Earl Gill? Okay, Earl. Yes, thank you very much, Wendy. Uh, Vicky thought it was an excellent um, overview you gave there. And, and you made a couple of points that sort of resonated with me because um, I've been in banking for quite a while and you talked about knowing your customer and uh, managing the risk and, and dealing with the, the situation from a bottom-up uh, uh, perspective. So, so my question really is, um, within this, this task force, are there any opportunities to get funding for educa educational staff, uh, for systems, systems enhancements? Because I believe that the smaller organizations uh, don't have the capability to upgrade their systems to provide the kind of um, information to manage and to know their customers uh, you know, so, so they get in a position of, of uh, knowing what they're doing uh, with the customer transactions. Well, thank you very much for that question. And I have been involved in reaching out to, 
actually the Office of Technical Assistance at US Treasury. Um, we're having a very interesting discussion about whether they will accept a proposal from the region as opposed to just the bilateral. And once again, we have an issue which we have to really think about as a region because it is small in size and therefore it would make sense to benefit from economies of scale. So we are trying to pursue that with treasury. They do have people who provide that kind of assistance and we can see how that might happen on a regional basis. Uh, we have talked with CARICOM and OECS about this as well. And the IDB, I should mention. I mean, one of the reasons for putting the Inter-American Development Bank on the task force is to be able to take advantage of the kind of technical assistance and funding and that they provide to do that kind of institutional capacity building. All right, excellent. I note two hands are up. Uh, let me acknowledge in the order that we will address you. Uh, Dalton Lee, the chair, I must, I mean, everyone understands why we'll be calling on Dalton now, right? That's my job right there. <laughs> uh, so we will speak with Dalton. Uh, Thomas, you're up immediately after Dalton, and then we go to Michael Spencer with a question. So Dalton, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Wendy. Um, in a very lively discussion this afternoon, and, and I thank you for, um, <clears throat> for moderating it on behalf of the Caribbean Association of Banks. My question really is to um, Gavin and, the, the, and his um, partners at um, Digital Financial. And in listening to their presentation, I couldn't help but notice that they focused on, you know, a lot of the process and how they thought you should go about um, presenting yourself and making yourself more attractive to the um, to the correspondent banks, but but I guess the, the question that I would have, and I and I know that there are probably a number of um, banks on this call that would have the same question is, have you seen um, any actual um, evidence that having done all of that, if you still don't meet that their business requirement? that they would onboard you? Because I think there, 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 there are a, a lot of small banks in the Caribbean, um, the one that I represent being one of them, where you know we've had a number of conversations with a number of correspondent banks in the United States. And it's, it's you know, they've requested you know, just a plethora of information. But at the end of it all, you know, it, it boils down to what, um, Vicky said um, about the risk. And it's not the risk of the movement of the money. It's the risk of the fine compared to the, the, the corresponding income that they would generate from the relationship. So I was wondering how, do you have any thoughts on how a small bank would get over that hurdle? Yeah, a very good question, um, Dalton. And, and, and look, you, you are correct in that, um, it doesn't matter how well you get your house in order. There may be times when, when, when a bank makes the wrong decision. And I've seen that and, and no doubt you've seen that as well. But that's why I think we also talk about the political angle, um, about how it's so important to firstly have the CAB, so you have a unified collective approach so that very much sharing the burden, sharing good practice and using the same language, having a, having a unified voice really works in these situations, I think. Uh, and secondly, the political angle with Washington for these US relationships. I think Washington and, and Vicky's um, presentation, absolutely fascinating and critical in, in, in those kind of levers and discussions to really highlight how important your region is and therefore why the banks should be encouraged to, to look very carefully at the attractiveness, so we can use that term, and, and, and make the right decision. Now, I've seen direct situations in the last 18 months where um, I've worked with clients who've gone to a, 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 a large bank for a correspondent relationship, have initially been told no, they've gone back with more information and evidence of how they have contained their risk, the small organization, and then had a, yes, that looks very good to us now. Now we understand this cost of, the compliance cost, and as Vicky said, we can work out the regulatory potential risk against the actual 
underlying um, business operations here. And in one of the cases I'm thinking about, um, there was an agreement that payments wouldn't be above a certain level, individual payments, to make sure that the small payments that are so important to families and individuals and small businesses could operate, but the large correspondent banking relationship wasn't going to be threatened by $10 million, $20 million, $100 million transfers um, that would create more regulatory risk. So Dalton, you're right in that it, it can be very frustrating when you get everything correct and, and you're still, you know, you still don't get a dance partner, as it were. Um, but I, I, I do think that um, it's really important not just to look at the process. You have to get the political and that unified voice with the CAB. I think that, that's much, much more important. Really. I hope that helps. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. I believe uh, I will apologize. I did say that I would be calling on Thomas. Vicky, I do see your hand up as well, so we will get to you. Okay. Okay. Lisa, I believe your hand was up uh, just before I called on Dalton. So can I give you an opportunity? Lisa Skinner? Yes, thank you very much. Um, I am uh, just putting in a little word for uh, Louis de Coker and his slide about the presentations to Financial Action Task Force. Um, if any of you in the audience have uh, direct stories that can speak to the idea of the problem of, uh, of overregulation, of it not being appropriate to your, to your client's needs, of it being in the way of uh, you serving your clients or of financial inclusion goals. Um, if you would be willing, perhaps through, through Wendy and Cab uh, or, or through, uh, I'm happy to share uh, Louis' email, uh, to, to send them to him because he, he presents uh, on behalf of CGAP, the consultative group uh, for the poor uh, and World Bank to FATF and he can really use actual examples, and he's got them from other regions of the world. He'd love some from the Caribbean. Great, Lisa, thank you for that. Um, and absolutely, we would be more than happy to collaborate any any uh, shared experiences that you will want to, uh, to put forth to us. Recognizing as well, one of the big challenges that we face within the Caribbean is the lack of information, lack, lack of data. Uh, it's something that Vicky and I have spoken quite a bit about. Uh, as we move forward, it is really important that we can provide empirical basis for any arguments that we will put forward on your behalf. Um, so I, I do encourage you to, to feed into the Caribbean Association of Banks. I believe Terry will uh, share with you again our uh, inbox information. So please feel free to reach out to us. Uh, Thomas, your hand is up and I want to acknowledge you at this point. Yes, uh, good day, everyone, and uh, I'll be brief, uh, realizing we're up on the hour. Uh, greetings from Bermuda, the, the northern outpost. Um, in many ways, we went through this crisis some time ago, uh, in 2015, to be exact. I was at the Bermuda Monetary Territory at the time, and we faced across the board de-risking from several large uh, U.S. Uh, global CIFIs. And what we basically did was uh, approach the ones that were still working with us, and we got the regulator involved with the banks had the face-to-face -face meetings, explained to them that we were moving to Basel III, uh, that we were undergoing a CFATF review, which now has turned out very positive for us. So we had to make the case, you know, just to preserve uh, our, uh, our remaining correspondent banking services. And now we find that some of those uh, that had retreated are coming back. So I think it just takes a, a coordinated approach with the regulator, uh, re representatives from the banks, maybe somebody from the Ministry of Finance, um, to all get in the same room and talk about what maybe the misperceptions are. So I'll look forward to another session sometime on this. I'll be glad to share more detailed experiences. Thank you. Wonderful, Thomas. Thank you for that. Um, we move to Michael Spencer. Michael? Good afternoon, Randy. Hi, Michael, thanks for joining. Yes, not a problem at all. Firstly, let me congratulate you and the team for this webinar this afternoon. Um, I find the discussions to be uh, highly interactive and, and very appropriate. Uh, I just have one question really, which is um, what impact uh, is the new AML 
um, Act of 2020 in the US likely to have on correspondent banking relationships. I don't know if two of you, one of the panelists could uh, respond to that. Thank you. Great, thank you. Brilliant question, Michael, and certainly relevant. Uh, Gavin, I don't know if you want to take the first tab. You are still on mute, Gavin, sorry. I was hoping I'd make the whole session without making that mistake. I know everyone makes that. <laughs> I apologize. Um, so, Michael, thank you. Um, I, I, I think, as ever, the, the answer on these things is that it's, it's too early to tell uh, in terms of um, the, the long term impact or the impact on, on these relationships. I do think, as Louis said, that, that there is a shift in the US, which is probably ahead of the curve in, some other, in terms of some other parts of the world, in terms of this recognition that blanket de-risking because it's easy isn't going to be looked at by the regulator in a particularly positive manner going forward and so i think I, i'm hopeful that this will result in more opportunities to have those those discussions to change the false perceptions and, and um vicky said something which i thought was very very uh, very real which was the word de-risking implies that there is risk to, 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 to eliminate. And that's why the banks are doing this, you know, doing the regulatory fine risk or compliance risk. Um, once there's that understanding, and if the regulatory move continues in the US with the Act and other actions, the, the banks have to really start documenting why they're de-risking, both on the individual level and on the, the, the wider collective level. That has to be a positive. Um, so I think too early to tell, really but it's i can't see it as being a negative so i hope that that helps excellent gavin i think that more than adequately answers the question at least i hope i'm speaking on behalf of uh the gentleman who posed it uh vicky i know that you were trying to to make a contribution earlier so can i ask you to proceed Sorry. Okay, yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sorry. I, my fingers don't work fast enough to unmute sometimes. No, I just wanted to make the point about um, the National Defense Authorization Act, an, an odd place actually to have placed these um, uh, particular provisions, which are in section 6204 through 6215 on money laundering, which is obviously a security risk. And so it is not inappropriate, but it is just a little surprising. And I did wanna make reference to that. Um, Ambassador Ronald Saunders was very active, Antigua and Barbuda, in reaching out to Maxine Waters, who is on the Financial um, Services Committee of the House. And it made a difference. It, it, it is a set of guidelines. It's not actual regulations, but it's a set of guidelines that I think interesting for this audience is the fact that it was also driven by charityandsecurity.org, which um, again, I believe that Gavin and Louis spoke about humanitarian assistance and some of the problems in moving humanitarian assistance, especially in you know, war-torn or troubled areas and the inability to know your customer in those particular cases and still the need for the money. So it's an interesting coalition of humanitarian and then small island states and you know poorer countries all needing to have correspondent banking relations re-looked at. So thank you, just a little clarification. Excellent, thank you so much for that uh, contribution, Vicky. I do recognize that we are almost 10 minutes over our anticipated hour with you. I am definitely a particular for time, and I certainly see the sun has come up over Gavin's shoulder. Um, I will put, allow one more question, should anything come our way? This is your last opportunity going once. Going twice. All right, there, go, there we go. All right, so... Uh, I hope that I speak on behalf of our panelists and participants, as well for my team and myself in saying that the conversation this afternoon has certainly been rich and very engaging. 
It would have been wonderful to spend a little bit more time with you this evening, but again, I note that the work day has just begun uh, in the land down under and is just coming to an end on this end of the globe. Uh, so to wrap up this evening's conversation, I will simply say that it has been a profound experience to sit with you to discuss with the key experts um, on the esteemed panel this afternoon, the foremost challenges impacting our industry. I believe that all who tuned into today's session would agree that the perspectives expressed were fresh, innovative, and certainly thought provoking. I will certainly be leaving with more than a couple key takeaways, and I'm hopeful that this, that this time has been well spent for our participants and panelists alike. We certainly have gotten some good feedback as we progressed our discussions this afternoon. Um, just as a, a note for you, we have included all of our links that you may join us on social media and subscribe to us on YouTube, where you will find um, the video of today's proceedings posted. Um, Vicky, Louis, unfortunately, had to leave a few minutes ago, and Gavin, through Lisa and Peter, a huge thank you for your willingness to spend time with us this evening as we continue to keep the conversation going and advocate for the betterment of the region's industry. I certainly look forward to our continued collaboration as we continue to advocate for and seek solutions that assist in strengthening our economies and environment in the Caribbean. Please stay tuned for more exciting and enriching initiatives from the CAB as we continue to keep the industry proactive, protected, and profitable, including our weekly list of mini conferences to be held during the month of May. Um, I will tell you that the panelists that we had this afternoon will be invited to speak again. Uh, perhaps we will have a little bit more time to prepare you as well with some more questions for them to ensure that you are comfortable with the changes that are happening in and around our jurisdiction and of course the steps that are being taken to represent you. So please look out for the invitations, take advantage and of course if you will uh, kept to the edge of your seat as I was this afternoon, you will invite someone else to join in to the conversations that are impacting us. Um, so we look forward to hosting you again. Until next time, please take good care and stay safe. Thank you again, panel.